go through the work. Um, and also once uh, the change of the business model happened and the agencies were sending back all your originals and the magazines were sending back your originals. So there was a lot of new stuff to look at, hmm. which was quite exciting. Um, and then this, it was, it was very difficult actually to edit. How do you edit 25 or 20 years of, of work about the transition to democracy? Where do you start? Where do you end? Um, you know, one doesn't want to make it too journalistic in terms of, of violence. There was no need to try and be in the activist mode of showing what's happening to get people to react to it. One wants to really dig in a little deeper to understand. Art. So could, the folks, could the folks who've got their microphones on, could you mute them, please? There's a lot go. of uh, kind of stretching I've, and noise. And I've, I've just got them, I'm just muting them now. Sorry, I'm just uh, shooting around, muting everybody that's joining. Um, uh, thank you, Matt. Um, so, you know, kind of how do you choose something that represents what this period was about in a way that is also suitable for an art world setting? Mm. So it was a little bit tricky. I'm not sure... Um, about some of the choices I left, but I think I touched all the high points and low points that were key to me from that period. Mm, mm, mm. Now, I suppose, Greg, that's, that's an interesting question that, you know, we were, we were discussing a little bit earlier was um, in, the, in, the, um, in the context of producing such a, the, such a portfolio like this, you have to make certain decisions. Um, and I suppose the the decisions, the decisions that you that you're making is in this editing process, and um, and you told me um, it was quite interesting. You you said uh, just related to these kinds of choices and one's archive that you recently um, had some uh, work returned, and you started going through this this um, you know bodies of work that you had long since forgot, forgotten. I think that's quite a nice point. To maybe you can talk us through the way that you come to put these kinds of portfolios together how they're informed? Um, yes, so I used to contribute to a French agency called Sigma, that's one of the kind of big three French agencies, and I would send them um, my work and they would choose stuff to be duplicated, physically duplicated and sent out to magazines and newspapers, and then my notes always on it were please return. Um, and they usually did, and, it was, and, and I've got boxes and, and cupboards full of stuff with Sigma material, and I've got my original faxes that would go out with the information, and a lot of my caption material, and in fact, a lot of the information, the, the, the fact-checking for Bang Bang Club um, was done by looking at these caption sheets and looking at what was scrawled on the edges of the neg sheets, because mm -hmm. those would be date stamps, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, before digital, there was no way of knowing what the date was when you shot a film unless you wrote a caption on the sleeve or, or a date on the sleeve. So um, getting these back was really quite wonderful. And, and, and the AP, oh, let me just, give me a sec. I'm just reaching over for something. Um, and then the, the AP who I used to work for, which is a wire agency, they used to select or we used to select um images and then we'd mark them and some of them were well well captioned and some of them were a little dubious um but there's tens of hundreds of of these neg sleeves and then you get the ones from time magazine and then you get the um the vomit bags from aeroplanes, which sometimes are the only things you could ship your film off in and you'd give it to another passenger and hope that he or she would contact whoever you were sending it to. And I've actually never lost anything that way, which is quite remarkable. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so to get all these things back together um, is difficult. And to know what you haven't got, unless it's something that's really stuck in your brain, is really tricky. So <clears throat> I thought I had everything. And there were some things missing and I thought, you know, who knows how they got lost, right? And sometimes maybe I lost them. Um, in fact, there's a, 
a funny anecdote. The Pulitzer Prize negatives, and there's like an, 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 um, an entry of 18 images yeah. from 1990 from Soweto and in Klazani. And so all those negatives that are shot for AP, they were in New York and they also had, please return to photographer. And once everything was done, they, they wanted to send it back to me, 92. And there's no, we've sent it back to you. I said, I haven't heard that they're back. Oh, it's back at your office. And I said, which office? And they said, oh, in Sarajevo. And this is in the middle of the siege. And it's like, what? Why is Sarajevo? <laughs> uh, we've seen your byline out of uh, former Yugoslavia. It's like, oh my God. You know, <laughs> so I had to go into Sarajevo um, through the siege to collect the negs and get them back because I thought, how long can you leave it there? Who knows what's going to happen in Sarajevo? Oh, yeah. at um, well, I suppose, Greg. That's a, sorry for interrupting, but I suppose that's an interesting that's an interesting point um, to bring to bring back to this to this this collection. So I just want to talk through some of the Im images because you know, in, among, in and amongst them, what you'd you know what you'd expect of the of the of the kind of the the conflict that really gripped um, gripped South Africa in the in the early nineties, which, um, which has come to, you know, which this, this work defines, there's these more poetic images. Um, and there's this, there's these sort of, there's these moments of silence and moments of pause that where the camera, the camera is, I suppose, in a way, allowed to linger a little bit longer and amongst because, you know, there's a, there's a, a different kind of pacing through the, the portfolio. There's this, you know, you're on the front lines and your head is ducked at the same time and your lens is the only thing that's up. But then there's these moments like I've got on the screen where um, there, there is, and I suppose I, I chose this one specifically because it's, this, it's appropriate in, 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 in the time that we're living now, um, which is, I suppose, photography's ability to, to you know, to, to capture these, these, quite, these quite sort of intense moments. Can you tell me a, bit, a little bit about the, your... Your way of your way of sort of of gleaning a narrative in these collection of images that we've got. Oh yeah, so it was really looking for pictures that um, had a had a time based value in terms of reflecting the era that we were speaking about for the Dead Zone portfolio, which was essentially the transition from apartheid to democracy and, and how tricky that birth was and how violent it was. And um, obviously that's what, you know, I was doing was covering the stuff mostly in the townships and in, in, in some of the homelands that where these things were happening. So it was trying to find which of these had a more lasting photographic value as well as historic value. Mm -hmm. So they're not all purely on photography. Some of them are more historically key and obviously I didn't choose anything that I didn't think had photographic value but some images that were purely of photographic value didn't fit into the historical context even though they were from the time and place and relating to some of that work um, and also if you see the portfolio it, it's got a page of the anecdotal type caption and then the photograph so you've got this pairing mm -hmm. um, which I think is very important. And that is one of the reasons that Joao Silva and I wrote Bang Bang Club was that the pictures were used and understood so far out of context that people just saw them as violence and they were either freaked out by it or filled some kind of uh, pre-concept that, that I probably wouldn't agree with. Um, and so we felt it important to contextualize that epoch. I mean, just as an example, I'm just going to I'm going to bring this um, this image up. Uh, this this carries quite an interesting, I suppose, example of how that how that violence kind of um, that that violence uh, 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 managed to stretch out and and impact um, impact uh, other other visitors. Um, uh, can can you tell us a little bit of, a little bit about this image, Greg? I, just a, again, it was one of the one of those moments of stillness that jumped out at me. Sure. I mean, this was, um, I think, a very important shoot. What, uh, there were several funerals. You can see how many graves have been dug. And this was in Rotunda, which is um, the township next to Heidelberg in what was then the Southern Transvaal. Um, and 
so many people had been killed while they were playing soccer, while they were trying to get to work in this conflict between Inkata and the ANC that was really based on unions and jobs that were available at the escort factory, which was around there. Um, and on this particular weekend following the violence, many people had died. So there was the soccer team who they were playing a game of soccer. And I think two people got killed. There was only a f one funeral where the people wore, I think one from either team was killed as I recall. And so the teammates and friends had all gathered while the grave digger was just waiting to fill in the grave because there were so many others to do. And if you had a kind of, if you step out of the photography mode and you kind of swivel in 360, there were like three or four other funerals happening. One was a ZCC funeral. One was a, a kind of, a, a, um, I forget, I don't know what, you, what I think it's John the Baptist, the church, um, and everyone is in their church gear. And that was quite phenomenal. Um, that was quite amazing scene because there was, people were completely getting um, going into a kind of trance and, and someone was possessed apparently and they had to bring him back. Um, I've just been actually scanning those images now. So, you know, so many things are happening, but as you say, sometimes it's the quiet moment that really catches your eye and also stands as a testament to what average people had to go through, whether they were involved or not. Greg, that's that's it's, it's quite fascinating because you know in we were we were discussing earlier that um, that you know as uh, and you brought up you brought up Susan Sontag earlier, which uh, the, thinks is somebody that sort of informs informs the way that you that you understand images. But you know, I'm I'm really glad that you you said you know you swivel 360 and there's just another another whole trip happening. Um, can you talk us talk us through the decision or the, the sort of the tyranny of the frame um, to, for for you know the, that 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 helps you make those decisions um, that are that are implicit in photography? Uh, that's a great question. So really, there is definitely this tyranny of of the two dimensional frame frame, and the fact that it's this fraction of a second that you're capturing, and you can shoot. 3,000 pictures, but you can only really use one or two um, from a particular day or a scene, I guess. And, and sometimes the frustration that we weren't shooting movies <laughs> instead of stills um, was key because, you know, you've got sound, you've got what people are telling you, you've got music, you've got um, ambience, you've got smell, you've got your baggage and your understanding and your background and what moves you based on you know, so many different psychological, emotional and historical things and gender and age and all these things play a part. And then so to try and find a way to define that accurately, so the thing about journalism and documentary film is that you can't just shoot it, for, can't just shoot it for purely photographic levels. Um, folks, please mute your um, microphones, those of you who haven't. So we've just had a whole bunch uh, just join. I saw, I saw. Um, so, you know, how do you choose a picture if you're looking at the documentary journalistic thing that's accurate to the story you're trying to tell? And on the other hand, you know, Strauss and Co, Co sells art and these pictures are being represented in an art world. How do you choose from those images that you shot things that perhaps break the bounds of, um, I don't want to call it illustrative, but it's close to illustrative photography and into something that's more about what it emotes and what it can evoke in viewers rather than telling a story. And that's tricky. Um, you know, that message can get very garbled and, it, and, and one can never control how people read and you've got to let go of the pictures at some stage. But I guess, um, that's where the editing and the choice in how you edit and how you present is just so key to any work. Mm -hmm. I suppose, um, you know, because you said, you said for, for you, it was important. It was important in this, in this portfolio, not to have, not to have explicit violence. You said, you know, that there were, there were, there was so much of this um, and, 
uh, you know, and, and, you know, it's so easy for us to fetish, fetishize that, that kind of explicit, that kind of, that explicit nature of, of the, of the extreme violence, quite frankly, that characterized the period. Um, how, how have you negotiated that without being, without, without kind of um, sacrificing, but sacrificing your, your principles and your endeavor for truth? I mean, it's, it's tricky. So I think um, there are some images that relate to violence, like um, maybe you want to show the ones from Tokoza of the aftermath. Well, there's the, there's the boy Patong, the little kid Aaron who was killed to, in the, the coffin there, the night vigil, the reddish picture. Um, so I photographed him on the morning after boy Patong, and he was this tiny dead baby on a blanket outside his home. And I didn't want to use that picture for this, even though I, I, I had published it and made it available for publication at the time as a news picture because it was important news, but I didn't think it should be in this particular collection. Mm -hmm. So, you know, whereas I didn't want to also, you don't want to soften things so much that the harsh reality of what people like the Matopes in, in this family, what the Matopes had to live through, right? Mm -hmm. You don't want to, um, denigrate the struggle and, and these were people who didn't plan to be in the struggle it was brought to them especially the child um, the baby in fact um, so you want to document that so that people don't kind of romanticize the struggle or diminish just how difficult it was to get rid of that evil system um, and I suppose the you know, what do you, what was your awareness at the time of, of your kind of conviction? Because I suppose what, you know, what the, 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 the biopics, the, the biopics that, that exist, you know, sort of give you, give an idea of these, these guys that kind of put their, put their lives, put their lives on the line and put their bodies at, uh, on the edge to bring these, to bring these images to the public. I mean, it was quite a, you know, it was, on, on, in terms of journalism, it was the front line. Um, what are you looking back? Um, were you were you reckless, or was it was it um, was it was it led by was it led by this kind of conviction to bring these images to the public? I mean, no matter how, yeah, I think it's all relative, right? So we're always trying to stay reasonably safe, and each. Each person working out there, radio, TV, text, whatever, all had different limitations imposed by the medium. And the thing about photography is that you've got, re you've got to really get close for this kind of work. There's no other way of doing it. Um, and the TV journalists went through the same thing, and even worse, because they had to get longer clips. They couldn't just get a couple of single images of a scene. They had to hold it and get it and, and really... Um, I think they had walls of steel, quite honestly, those people that we used to work with. Uh, but I think there was a drive to the people who were doing it. It was, you know, there were a lot of photographers, journalists who did not cover this kind of work for whatever reason. Some were politically opposed to it. Some didn't find it that kind of beat. Maybe some were art journalists. Or, but there were, for example, art journalists who decided they wanted to cover this kind of stuff because it's so critical to that moment in history. Um, so were we, were we reckless? You know, I remember a few occasions where I was reckless um, and nothing happened. And then on the other occasions when I thought I was being really careful, um, you know, I got wounded. Okay. So in fact, every time I got wounded, I, it was four times in total, different occasions, I never felt I was taking extraordinary risks. I mean, um, so, so I think, you know, the image of recklessness to get the pictures is not accurate. Mm -hmm. and, and I can't recall getting decent pictures from any one of those times. Yes. So um, I think we, I was personally driven by wanting to record what this was. You know, I was, I was committed to getting rid of the apartheid regime, but I wasn't a, a political player. This was my way of doing it. And I, and I, and I then became more moved by people's plight and friendships that I had um, with families like the Raposa in Soweto and, you know, all over the place. You would make connections that some were brief and, and passing and some have lasted till now. 
Mm -hmm. um, and so you want to document that, and there's no other way of documenting it but getting close. Is that reckless? I don't know. Certainly, I mean, yeah, this one was pretty stupid, I guess. I mean, this was, this is this is the this is you know the the image, I suppose, for me. If you if you don't mind me saying, and again, I, I'm I'm just I'm 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 fascinated because you know of the point of the point in in like a subject. I mean, this is also again one of those you know one of those pictures that is you know a once in a lifetime thing because the subject interacts with you. And there's this moment where, you know, as a viewer, your heart stops for a second um, and you want to kind of know more. Uh, again, I'm not wanting to romanticize this, but tell me, to, I mean, I just, uh, I saw your reaction now. Uh, can you talk us, can you talk us through a little bit of, of, of what was happening here and, um, and, and, and the day? And, so this uh, was, um, KwaZulu Natal, and it was 95 or 96, I'd have to see the date, it was, so it was 95, I think, it was after democracy, but the war kept going, right, and um, th there's quite a few pictures from after 94, in fact, that are quite violent, but in this case, this guy was one of several Encarta people involved in a march, and that led to people shooting into houses, um, as they were going on the march through the area. But thankfully he'd run out of bullets, which is why he was running back to get another clip or to reload, um, which is why he only used the finger against us. But we, these were the guys who were armed by the, the national party uh, government regime, uh, Ivor Powell and those people in, in Inkata. Um, so these are the, the guys who were trained in Caprivi, and came back and all those weapons and you know everything from anti-tank weapons were buried and hidden and some they've been retrieved and some haven't so this was very important to try and document and it was rare that we had a chance to actually in the south african context photograph um combatants with guns mostly they were hidden because the cops were so keen to take them at least from the anc side um, and whereas this was an encarta guy so you know this was quite terrifying but quite safe because he didn't have a weapon and this was going to bludgeon us to death. <laughs> um, Greg, um, you know, I suppose um, your, your, um, uh, your, your recent work, um, how, how much, how much is informed of, of, you know, the, the, the contributions and, um, and the, the, the point of memory, um, how much of your, of your work now consists of, um, I suppose this, this kind of recontextualizing what these moments mean in in our in our current in our current his, historical moment. Mm. If I can just do a slight di uh, digression there, um, Goldblatt, uh, David Goldblatt, once said that he'd stopped photographing for a foreign audience in the lo in his last several decades. He was only interested in photographing for a South African audience. And what he meant by that is he didn't want to have to explain everything. He didn't want to have to dumb down his work to make it understandable to the uninitiated or those who didn't get the background and context and culture. So obviously journalism is the exact opposite of that. But in choosing these, I didn't want things to be what I referred to hesitatingly, hesitantly earlier as um, illustrative because that's a kind of kiss of death. It's you know, how do you illustrate a text in a magazine or a newspaper? But rather I wanted them to have their, their own life and their own vitality in terms of what they did for that historical moment and also how they expressed how I feel. Mm -hmm. So bringing that into view with more recent work, um, it's certainly with my South African work in, in the decades after that, everything I saw was through the lens of what apartheid had been, um, how people lived, especially in the homelands, that was of a particular interest to me, and how people were coping with these changes. So, and understanding that who of a certain age had what kind of lens that they viewed me from, themselves from, as I was looking at them. Um, <coughs> and I think that's key, you know, you don't know a p person's particular background, but you certainly know the historical epoch that they lived through. And, and, and so that always informed me. Like, for example, Marikana, 
I saw so many kind of so much resonance with the 90s in how the striking miners had decided to make their their case for a better and a living wage. Now, um, Greg, I, I was, you know, I suppose one of the the questions I, I googled your most recent book earlier, and I, I just wanted to do, I wanted to bring that I wanted to bring mention that as well because I suppose in this way we're talking um, about really how photographs can act as these wonderful the wonderful capacity for storytelling but also when paired with how they how they function different differently when paired with the the word when paired with the written word um and and you know how narratives influence and illustrate and this i suppose tension between between these two moments of storytelling um Tell us a little bit about your uh, new, your new book, uh, Snapshots from the, is it Snapshot? Shots from the Edge. Shots from the Edge. Shots from the Edge. Yeah. You almost got me to say it wrong. Um, <laughs> it's, it's a collection of short stories, nonfiction, journalistic style short stories of things that I'd, uh, there, thank you, or things that I'd experienced over these years and stuff that was quite arbitrary in terms of where I felt there was a really good story to be told, something that would help us understand really the moment we're living through now. And so much of it in this moment of crazy politics and even, even before the pandemic, but you know, what is a crisis gonna give rise to? And many of these stories are of people living through a larger crisis and how they respond to it. And, and I think it's key to understand that we can be strong, that we don't have to give in to injustice yeah. and, and bullies, no. be it financial bullies or um, physical bullies and policing or, or whatever it is. Um, so I like the kind of, the same reason that I said, that I mentioned Goldblatt, that he wants people who understand the background to see his photographs. I felt that this would help people understand various things, at least the tiny sliver that I understood. So Rwanda, what do I know about Rwanda? Very little, but what I understood I could relate, right? And those times and places specifically, or Zaire and, you know, South Africa a lot, obviously, or Somalia. And I think these are valuable documents, besides hopefully being a good read. Mm -hmm. Now, Greg, I'm just, I'm curious with the, with the, 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 um, number of uh, in the in the photograph how did you arrive at 41 um, what was the what was the pairing down process uh, it's just it's an interesting it's an interesting sort of nuance that i picked up in the cataloging um, and yeah i was just sorry it seems like it's such an arbitrary question but and it's an arbitrary number yeah <laughs> truthfully it it yeah. i think it was to do with deadlines and the timing of when we wanted to print it and get those things done and it felt right. It felt unified. The order felt right. The um, the rhythm felt good. The the patterning of the images, what was shown, what wasn't shown, I just felt just sufficient. It didn't need another one of what I had available then, and it didn't didn't I didn't want to do one less. I think it it had the balance that satisfied me so i really wasn't looking at numbers i know portfolios should have yeah, a specific right. number perhaps but no that it was really did it feel right and greg how does it how does it feel as you said you know what what really fascinated me earlier was um you know as a as a photographer you know you constantly you're constantly screening screening work editing work as we've as we've been discussing um how does it feel to be confronted now by this by this old archive and how does it fill in your understanding of that period? I mean, how does it force you to reevaluate your archive and thus your understanding of that moment? That's interesting. Um, I think the further we get away from an incident, um, the more simplified our thinking about it can become if we're not careful, right? So we look at this image and it's very graphic and uh, it seems quite simple, right? It was a simple encounter, um, but what does it mean? What What's the truth underneath it? Yeah. How do you represent that photographically and in a set of photographs? Because there's a narrative that's evoked by a series of photographs as opposed to individual things. 
and there's the knowledge that you have when you're looking at stuff. So when I, uh, when I was photographing this, I had a certain amount of knowledge. Um, but years later, I have a lot more knowledge about what was going on behind the scenes, more about myself, I guess. Um, not more about this individual who I never saw again, thankfully, after this. Um, but, you know, without being historical about it, I think time just tends to telescope events and compress events. So it's a matter of really bringing back the fullness of things and trying to keep it less abstract um, and more true to the origin of what you were doing at the time is key to me. I don't want things to be abstracted from their truth. Greg, that's a quite an interesting point because at the, I mean, my next, my next question is, um, I suppose, zooms, zooms a bit, uh, zooms forward to the present. So, so um, you're, you're currently, um, you're currently giving a, giving a, a, a an online class in Harvard, as you uh, would, um, uh, told us a, a little bit about in the beginning, um, on, uh, um, in, an, in, in advanced photographics, um, and then your faculty at uh, Boston University. How does, how does this, this archival process, um, and I suppose specifically these kinds of these kinds of portfolios now with the distance of time you've got you've got the space to bracket these kinds of works into portfolios to neatly sort of that describe these that these describe these quite large slivers of you know very niche um, uh, 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 traumas I suppose in, uh, in in South Africa. Um, what is what's what's happening in your in your current practice and. How is this? How is this? Is this emblematic of your, of your current practice? And grace and 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 um, I'm gonna gonna mute you quickly. Ooh. Hi, yeah, there we go. All right. <laughs> okay. Zoom etiquette. We all get to get good at it eventually. No, exactly. <laughs> We're learning every day. Yeah. Sorry, so yeah, I was speaking about where you are now um, and, and how this is this process um, sort of informs your looking your looking today forwards and backwards. Okay, so so that's a two-part question with a bit more than two parts of an answer. So essentially <laughs> what I'm doing is that I'm I'm finally scanning on high quality my entire archive, every single negative, whether they're good or bad, without choosing carefully and selecting this picture or that picture which was suitable on the day in the week after on the year after whatever the reason was that i edited and scanned or edited and printed images at the time so some were contem contemporaneous some were with hindsight um so i'm doing everything so almost like as if i shot it digitally where you can look at every single image and be able to choose it and that's been interesting. And obviously, you know, the, the dead zone is about a specific aspect of South Africa's history, whereas my work covers many things, you know, obviously not just violence and politics, mm. um, though primarily, I would say. <laughs> um, and then, so I'm putting that together and hopefully going to be printing a series of books on that. Um, it's very difficult to sl to slice this up and to make these things understandable. Being that that was one of the big problems with with um, Dead Zone for me was how do you bring this all together into a single thing? To cause I mean, that picture that you've got up on the screen. This was an SDU kid who got assassinated at close range, and you know that plastic driving cap was was still burning from the the point blank range of the bullet. Um, you know, Tokoza, I have thousands of images of Tokoza, three books on Tokoza that I could do from then and as from continuing working with Tokoza, you know, up until 2012, when, when 2013, when we came to the States. Um, yet, at the moment, in terms of fresh work, I'm really doing very soft stuff. I'm really shooting <laughs> quite peculiar stuff. So I'm shooting pink flamingos in a very strange way with kind of color reversal, um, tungsten film, four by five. 
and I'm shooting religious icons in how people present them in, in ways that I find interesting, also on, on medium format. So these are kind of, uh, they have no meaning outside of what they are. They're purely aesthetic um, and of curiosity. And I like that. It's not demanding while I work through this archive that I can apply all the kind of analytical care and historical thinking and also dredging my own memories and, and emotions of the time into how I feel they should be presented now. Um, and Greg, I suppose I didn't really want to make it a focus because it's, um, it's not, it's not, well, I suppose it's not a hugely important question, but it's nevertheless, it's, uh, it's, I think it's, it's quite, quite interesting for the way that people can understand the medium. So tell me, um, first, first part, why is film trendy again? <laughs> because, because, um, <laughs> because, um, because, because, because I can, you know, you're, you're, one of the, one of the things about your work is that tactility that you can see from a mile away that it was shot on 35 mil. I'm glad you brought up the medium format. So you can see what it, you can see it was shot on 35 mil. There's something about the grain. There's something about the atmosphere and your lighting. Um, that is, that is just signature. Um, and, and so, you know, we, and as I said, films somehow become trendy again because everybody sort of yearns for this, um, I suppose, you know, this, this, you know, the, the, the retro, the retro has suddenly become cool again. Um, and can you just tell us a little bit about your sort of views on, on, on where you were as a photographer with film and how have you seen that, how have you seen that sort of come, come, come full force because people are now again looking for the, you know, it's the, it's the hand printed, um, you know, grain, um, stuff that looks like a grainy, the stuff that looks like a photograph that people are after again. Um, Absolutely. You know, I, I fell in love with photography. It must have been three or four years after I actually started photographing when I started shooting on a large format and understanding it properly. Um, and it took me a long time to, to, to be able to get technically competent and visually competent. Um, and then digital came along and it was always, in the beginning it was poor, it was convenient, but it was poor. And I never really fell in love with digital. It's very convenient, it's clean, it's good. The autofocus, uh, everything's, am those are amazing cameras. I would have given my left arm for a camera that performed like that in these times. But it's, faultless you know the only fault is yours and whereas analog especially i shoot with all kinds of cameras on purpose stuff i've never used before i'll go do a shoot that's key to me because i want to fumble i want to make mistakes i want to know if there's a light leak or if i mess it up in the dark room this is part of the process it's part of the genealogy of a photograph and you don't have that with digital mm. Mm. you have to introduce it artificially with digital and i think that and people wanting to get away from screens, at least at one stage, um, is why people want to shoot on film. They want to have a thing that's there, not a hard drive that's going to fail or a cloud surface that's going to go bankrupt. Um, and and I, I must tell you, if this shot, if this material had been shot on digital, would I be able to find all of it? Would it get returned from some agency or or newspaper 30 years after it was shot? No, it would have been gone long ago. No. Um, so no. there's that. No. 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 And I like the uncertainty. I think there's something to uncertainty. It's the same thing about not pretending you know everything about anything. Um, it, it's part of the mystery of what's going to come out. I like that. Fantastic. Greg, I'm going to, I'm going to, I see we are, um, we, we're driving up to quarter two. So I'm going to, um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen from here. And I'm going to open up, um, I'm going to open up to the floor to see if we've, um, we've got, uh, we've got any, uh, any questions for, for Greg. Um, it's a very special guest today, um, Greg Marinovich, ladies and gentlemen. Um, and uh, uh, I'm going to just, um, just uh, ask for a show of hands if anybody wants, um, or wants to ask a question. Um, I think there's a little function um, in the in the in the side that uh, we can raise raise any hand. Yeah. In the chat function next to your name, you can raise your hand virtually. I can't see everyone's screen, so hopefully you can. 
Um, yeah, I've got uh, I've got sort of three. Oh, I've got a I've got a hand in the in the middle here. Um, this is uh, and um, I've I'll, I'll, I'll guest from Ireland. Hello, sir. Hello. How are you? Hello. Very good. Thank you. Uh, I have a question for Greg. Uh, sure. The uh, Mandela images. When when and where were they taken? Um, sorry, could you just give me your name as to who's talking? There's a lot of images. It's difficult for me to find. I'll I'll yeah. find them for you, Greg. Here we go. Uh, okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, no, no, not that. No, no. I mean, who's asking the question? Oh, um, Terry. Terry here. Oh, Terry. Oh, Paula Walker. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that, yeah. <laughs> I'm pir I'm pirating. <laughs> <laughs> um, so these were. This is quite a funny story. This was not the news context. The news context was um, violence that was happening in KwaZulu-Natal between, oddly enough, the UDM and um, ANC. And it was just dragging on and on and on. And, and Joao Silva and myself were down there photographing it. I, I'm sure somebody else, I think maybe Odd Anderson. And um, we were driving back to Johannesburg that night, it was a Sunday night, and I got a call from the New York Times um, that they wanted images because they were writing a story. And it's like, uh, I've been shooting on slide film. There's nowhere to get this processed on a Sunday night. Um, but I thought, you know, I know about, I've heard about this cross processing thing where you process it in color negative. So when I got home, I just clipped like in, in, in a dark bag, I clipped a, what I thought would be stuff I had of Mandela coming to visit. Uh, and I cross-processed it and then kind of fiddled with it in, in Photoshop till it almost looked normal. Um, but the, the, the wild color variations of that set were kind of fun. Um, and he was really angry and he was really accessible. So he landed in this helicopter with that, that blonde uh, guy who always used to protect him, whose who's, who's name I don't know, but he's quite well known. Um, and that was it, one bodyguard, and he walked into this war zone to yell at people and tell them to get their act together. So that you was- You photographed him a couple of times, hey, Greg? Say that again? You photographed him a couple of times, didn't you? <laughs> a lot. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, he was, you know, obviously key. And this was during the election campaign, what we're seeing on screen. Um, but, so, so that was Paul, right? Or James? Terry? Terry. Yes. yes. Terry. Hey, does that answer what, is that what you yes. want? To... Yes, I just, I, I, I saw the look of concern on his face and I just wondered uh, why, why that was so. So I mean, thank, was, thank you. <coughs> Pleasure. He was deeply yes. angry. Um, yes. and, and that was the thing about Mandela, you know, he was very charming and, you know, he would glad hand people he had to, he was very political, but when he was angry, he didn't, I mean, I guess he did hide that tongue, but to me, it seemed he didn't hide it. When he got annoyed, he was annoyed. And he yes, said, he must have been very frustrated by the look on his face, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks, Greg. Thanks for the question. Greg, what was, what was, his, um, what was Mandela's relationship um, to, the, to, the, to the press corps at the time? Did he know, was he aware of the power of, um, of images? And did he, like, did he work with you guys? Oh, I mean, I don't think he worked. He ignored us or he charmed us. Like he would come up, oh, it's so nice to see you again. Yeah. And I mean, I don't think he really knew who you were. Most of 90% of us, I think there were a few people he knew. Um, you know, he knew Magubani, he knew Alf Kamala, he knew those kind of people, but certainly he didn't know who I was individually. Yeah. I don't think. Um, but he was just very charming and he made you feel very welcome and he he understood that the press was sometimes an ally to his cause but also that was an essential part of a democracy mm. so there was none of the stuff you see nowadays in terms of um, blocking of access and that and some of it was political i mean like the whole thing about you know him being a boxer and him and winnie a lot of those choices were political on how it looked to create the dynamic of this power couple. So he was very aware of it, but I don't think that invalidates the warmth of the man. Yeah, yeah absolutely. 
Well, thank you, thank you so much, uh, thank you so much, Terry, for that question. It's a really nice. Uh, it's a, it's a, a really, uh, I suppose, a, a, a ray of, uh, of sunshine always comes when Mandela is mentioned. Um, it's, yeah, it's lovely. Um, do we have any other questions? Uh, I see a, a hand raised. Um, thank you, Mr. O'Toole, um, for joining us. Uh, if, Greg, I think a familiar face to you as well. Very much so. Hi, Sean. How's it, Greg? How's it? Of course, how's it? Sorry, I've lost <laughs> a lot. How's it? Yeah. Um, I'll just jump straight into the question. Um, it's one of the images in your portfolio. Um, it's titled Shoes Number One. It's probably one of, I mean, the defining images of that very turbulent trans transition. Um, th this is the one from Tokoza, or the, I just haven't got it in front of me. Is that the oh, okay. one from the, man, the man's feet next to the, you just see the feet next to the shoes? Uh, it's a slightly wider frame. It's the three soldiers with a helmet. There's a man oh, lying okay, in front okay. of them. His, his face is covered um, with the shoes. Yeah, yeah. On. So <laughs> I think so it's outside Shell House, right? Yeah, that is during Shell House. Um, that wasn't, I mean, that is at the library garden. So it was part of the whole overall day but it was about what half a kilometer away maybe more um so what did you want to know about this i mean you said something in your talk where you said time telescopes and compresses events and um where you're revisiting and you can be very specific about discovering details um i'm just using this image as an instance but um very often with news images um the subjects remain anonymous. Have you, for instance, with that particular image, been able to clarify who the man is that is uh, dead? And then a separate question, also more broadly about sort of revisiting the past. Um, with Tokoza particularly, have you revisited the area? And are you, um, how do you look at, say, a very young photographer that's come out of Tokoza now uh, a Magnum nominee, Linda Kuchle Sobekwa. So those are my two questions. Thank you, Greg. Three questions. Um, so, <laughs> so, so I do have, the, I don't have the, the, this man's name in front of me, but I do have his name and he's identified and he's also identified in, in the story that I wrote in the new book that, that um, Matt was talking about, um, about Shell House. And that and that goes to the the knowledge of um, what we knew at the time. So you can see those soldiers and the man on the left are all looking up. They're in the driveway leading to the underground parking um, underneath the library gardens, which I don't think exists anymore. It, it's a different entrance nowadays. Um, but they were looking up at the top of the standard bank, uh, the, the, where the standard bank was. There was um, across the street, which I think is is it. Anyway, I won't try and guess which, I think Bree, maybe. Um, because that's where they felt the shots were coming from. And there were reportedly many reports of snipers. The police report at the time said, no, no snipers. There was an investigation afterwards and they couldn't ascertain. But oddly enough, uh, during Marikana, um, I met a guy who was doing security for Lanman, who was a former police sniper. So, you know, a former police sniper contacts you, wants to tell you the truth about something. It's like, sure, right, you know, another fantasist. But it wasn't. It was verified by two or three other people, one of whom was a fellow journalist who had contacts with the security forces. This guy was the real thing, and he killed, like, I think 44 people, he told me. Um, but he said there were definitely snipers on top, but he, he refused to tell me who they were, which lets you know that, you know, who they were associated with. At, at any rate. So this is one of those things that spawned conspiracy theories and denials and lies and, and subterfuge. Yet the picture, I think, clearly tells you this man was not shot from anywhere else but where everybody thinks the danger is coming from. And, and that's what I like about that. I also like the fact that this is, um, I shot this scene twice. The first time was just after he'd been shot the soldiers in completely different positions, but this man's shoes were on. But somebody recognized him and his father was part of the march and they phoned the father 
And so that's how I got the guy's name. The father came to see the guy and people told me who he was. People knew who he was. Um, this second picture, people have taken off his shoes because of the whole um, understanding that you shouldn't carry the impurities of, of having walked on, on the earth with your shoes into the afterlife. So it's a pollution issue. So, um, you know, that's what I like about even what, as much as I like what's in the frame, I also like what's not in the frame. And I think it's key. And I think, um, which is why I do long winded explanations of some of my images, because otherwise, what's it look like? You know, if you don't know what this is about, what's it say? It shows black people killing black people or black people with weapons. And it's just racist, essentially. So context is key. And, and, and when this thing crosses from journalism and documentary into an art forum, it's, it's very important that information is shown. Um, the other question to Koza. Yes, I have seen his work and he looks really interesting. And I'd love to see more. Um, and I'm so glad he's in, I hope he sticks to it and makes sure he uses a step to, to succeed and, and, and get his voice heard out there. And Tokoza, yes, I've, I'm constantly in touch with people in Tokoza, and I have been ever since in various degrees. And I started doing a documentary on a, on a former commander from Slovo section, which is the one nearest um, opposite that hostel that you were showing earlier, Matt, the, the Kamala Street hostels in Shire Zafi and those things in Shire Zafi. Um, in Kamala Street with those burning tires, that's Kamala Street. I mean, a lot. Those, those, those young boys those on top of the bus going to a funeral, that's Kamala Street. A lot happened in Kamala Street. Um, so I was doing a documentary on this guy, and I had three or four other characters. And during the making of my film in 2012, he got assassinated. And he'd already be, he was already in a wheelchair. So it was really... Um, and dreadful thing. You can read about the full story in the in the book, in, in the in the shots from the edge. But essentially, you know, his sister got brutally raped and murdered, another family member got killed, one died, mother died. It was just the most devastating series of events that happened to this. And no one's ever been caught. Um, even though there's every indication that everybody knows who it is, but the police have just been negligent at the least, corrupt, most likely. Um, Greg, there's, um, you know, there was a, there was a, a, a quote that um, actually that that I was looking at um, by, by Sean um, in his in his introductory essay to the to the portfolio, um, where he calls he calls photography a, uh, he describes it as a peerless witness, um, where um, there is I suppose nobody else that uh, nobody else that comes to that comes to the the moment. Um, there is the there is what the um, there is what the what exists in the frame, um, and that's what what we're given. How do you how do you at the same time as you know these works um, uh, are, 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 in, are you know are informed by your context? How do you how do you detach from them at the same time? Um, so first of all, I don't think one should detach. I think there's no point in detaching. Um, I don't think one should feel better about these things um, with time or, or with this, this, um, this kind of myth, maybe a myth, maybe old wives tale of the lens being the protection between you and your feelings. I mean, that's rubbish. I mean, there's a couple of fractions of a second that you're shooting the rest of the time, your camera's at your side and you're participating in, in the event in some way or another. Um, and in terms of peerless witness, I mean, I think photography is phenomenal. I love photography. The more interesting work I see, the more I love photography, but I also think it's a very deceptive medium, which is why it's such a favorite of propagandists, is that this, this separation of this tiny fraction within this complete 360 degree thing of that one to 50th of a second, and then how many other of those 249 parts of the second are you not seeing and not capturing, and, and, and then editing that down later, uh, it's a distillation 
of other truths into an image. It isn't an accurate reflection of an overall thing, and hopefully it's a completely honest and truthful reflection of what you saw in the viewfinder at that time and that you were never stage managing and that you didn't manipulate afterwards and you're not misrepresenting what the case is, all those kind of things that can lead essentially to propaganda. Um, but also it's, it's an abstraction, it's a distillation, it's, a, it's one photographer's version of an understanding of what's going on and what they happen to be technically able to capture at that time. It's very peculiar sport, photography is. Greg, thank you so much. And I think um I think that's a wonderful way, a wonderful way to conclude today. Um on the on the stroke of five. Um it's uh, really been a thrill, a thrill having you and um, you know, uh uh, we would welcome Strauss and Company would welcome you back. Um, uh, just uh, perhaps um, for for any for any other platforms that we want to speak about um, issues of photography and uh, and you know our, our understanding of the medium. Um, suppose we're really starting to see um, such enthusiasm grow for collectors in photography that um, you know to have to have somebody like yourself come and talk us through at the same time as at the same time some of the some of the practical. Some of the practical elements, um, also you know, some of the some of the um, the poetry that uh, that exists, and some of the responsibilities um, that exist uh, with that come with the medium. So that was really really incredible to hear from you, Greg. Thank you so much. Uh, I see Susie's Susie's got a Susie's got a hand. Um, Greg, thank you because it's always such an incredible treat to listen to you. Um, and maybe just the bit that I'd like to add is that I, I was lucky enough to be part of that sitting in your house and um, was it Emerentia that you used to live when you were in Joburg and yeah and and going through some of those images and I can tell you that 41 it could have been 83 it was just yeah. incredibly it was such a privilege but I think maybe Greg wouldn't say this but I think the one joy of having 41 images is that it is, if you want, it's an exhibition too. So if you go to the Constitutional Court now, um, the Dippinars very kindly bought one of the lots that we sold um, two years ago and they donated it back to the Cons Court and it looks incredible. You can go and see the pictures, they're up. We saw them the other day when we were there. And I think that's the most extraordinary thing about this portfolio is that yes, you can look at them per image and you could read uh, Sean's introduction and Carl's curating and Greg's explanation, but you can have it up as an entire exhibition and 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 capture moments in our history which are are pretty time stopping. Um, and the other the other portfolio is in the Brenthurst Library, and so two incredibly important institutions have this um, portfolio, and there are only three more. So it is an incredible opportunity also to purchase this portfolio. Um, and as a, always, a treat to see you, Greg. Keep well. Thanks, Susie. I appreciate it very much. Bye, all. Thank you for taking part. Thank you so much, Greg. And um, I'm just going to just going to conclude here to say thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for joining Strauss and Company uh, in, in very special company with Greg Marinovich, all the way from Boston, Massachusetts, today, talking us through um, his lot number eleven on our online sale of modern post-war contemporary art, Asian arts, jewelry, and wine. Um, and Greg uh, Marinovich's portfolio is lot number eleven, entitled "Dead Zone." And um, in that work, you can um, uh, the successful buyer will um, have forty-one. Uh, edition photographs. It's a small edition. Um, I think this is the three out of five. Um, and uh, uh, as Susie, as Susie rightfully said, this is indeed a traveling exhibition. Um, and uh, an amazing, amazing thing to amazing thing to to have. Uh, we thank all of those visitors. Um, I'm just getting some notes and thanks in the in the chat column here. Um, thanks to all of the visitors from um, from from far aboard. Uh, again, Terry. Um, I, a familiar face that we've seen every day for um, it's been nice of nice of you to join us again um and uh then um ladies and gentlemen i'd just like to remind you that um for the auction concludes tomorrow and that's going to be the final um uh, final edition in uh, this run of our um online of our online zoom walkabouts with the sale um the, again it's really been so fantastic for so many of you to express your enthusiasm by giving us your time and uh, 
We had a really fantastic yesterday, Greg Marinovich, talking about some of the broader issues of photography uh, um, uh, that uh, really uh, give the medium or lend the medium to uh, to to the the documenting and recording of history, but also some of the silences and uh, and some of the silences and moments of poetry that uh, that permeates that permeate um, uh, these uh, very often very often. Um, uh, quite turbulent times in our history. So, um, again, Greg, thank you so much, and um, enjoy the rest of your day. It's only beginning, um, and uh, thanks, thanks so, so much for giving us your giving us your morning. And um, I'm going to, on the stroke of five past, I'm going to um, say thank you very, uh, to everybody that uh, has given us your comments in the in the uh, in the sides here, and um, and it's been really fantastic joining um, for you to join us. And uh, we will again see you see you tomorrow for the final installment. Greg, again, so wonderful to meet you. Uh, I suppose in this post pandemic uh, in this post pandemic world of communication, um, and uh, so wonderful that um, uh, you know I'm sure I'm sure that uh, we will we will see you again, um, uh, and we'll be. I, I look forward to the next opportunity. Yeah. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye-bye, ladies and gentlemen. Have a good day for our American viewers and have a good evening to South Africa. Thank you. Bye-bye.